I had a typical high school experience like any kids have, where you go to school all day, and then you have an after school job, and you have extracurricular activities. And I was busy. So when I went to college, I had an enormous amount of free time. I had class two, maybe three hours a day, and I had all this time to fill for the rest of the day. And I didn't know how to fill it. I hadn't been taught how to fill it. And I filled it unproductively in ways that college kids often fill their time. I was not studying. Um, I did not fail. Uh, <laughs> but I, I wasn't feeling my time productively, and it was unsatisfying. <laughs> And I did that for three years. And then I called my grandmother and asked if I could move in with her. I knew that I needed something that I, had, that I didn't have. And I called her and asked if I could move in with her. And I showed up at her house and, you know, I was a punk. I, I was young and I didn't know what I was doing. And I had this big black trash bag full of clothes. And she said, put your clothes upstairs and meet me in the garden. This is her in her garden. She lives on the Blue Ridge Parkway in the Appalachian Mountains. And I lived with her for the next eight years. And I spent the first three months doing nothing but following her. I did everything she did. If she worked in the garden, I worked in the garden. If she went to woodworking, I went to woodworking. If she painted a picture, I painted a picture. And I followed her around, and I began for the first time to see how a person is supposed to fill their time. And she made me into a productive person. I built my first bookshelf in that three months. I wove my first basket. I made my first quilt in those three months. I painted up teen million pictures, um, I learned how to produce things. And it added an enormous sense of value to, and meaning to my life. It gave me this enormous sense of worthiness. And I felt like I was a contributing member of, of the tribe for the first time. And I spent the last several years in a doctoral program thinking about the enormous gift that she gave me, trying to understand what she did to me and trying to figure out how I can share this with the world, how I can teach my children this way of being, or my friends and family, my students, the people that I encounter in reaching the world. And in order to do that, I've had to think of a lot about human production practices. And this is one type of thing that humans make, right? And this object has no maker. It's not made by a single person. It's made by some group of people who brought it into the world for no specific purpose. It's not destined to go anywhere when it's created. You can almost smell this, right? <laughs> and there's a lot of this stuff. It's part of the junk economy. This is another type of product that, that people make. My grandmother made these baskets for my dad's fireplace. He has a big fireplace, and she wanted to adorn it. And so she wove these baskets. They were made by a specific person and for a, a particular place. They were brought into being purposely and mindfully. And there's not as much of this as there is of this now. And so I've been thinking about how that happens. In order to, to think about that, I've had to think about hyperconsumerism because as, as the junk economy sort of takes over, we become more and more hyperconsumer. And one example of how hyperconsumerism happened in our world is that the automobile chassis took 12 and a half hours to create in 1913, and by 1914 it only took one and a half hours. So there was a tenfold increase in one year. And in the 20th century, that happened with lots of different products. You see all these graphs where we became really good and efficient at producing things. And in order to increase your production capacity by that much, you either have to consume more or produce less. And we chose to consume more, which makes sense because we're a Protestant work ethic culture. So we want to produce as much as we can. We have that urge. So we had to increase consumption, which is unfortunate because consumerism is associated with reduced personal well-being. So that's a problem that we have to negotiate in our culture. And in order to think about that, we have to talk about economics, because that's what it's really about, right? There's a big economic meta narrative. It's the grand story of our time. And a lot of our policies and behaviors and decisions are driven in part, if not wholly, by economics. And when we live in a world where you can buy things cheaper than you can make them, which is often the case, we have to have justification narratives for making things, because you have to overcome that economic barrier. And a justification narrative is a budgeting term. It's about um, allocating resources for making things. Some of the narratives that we use, artists, is one narrative. I have a unique spiritual calling to make something and to make this thing, and, and I'm going to put my resources to it because of that calling. That's one way we justify it. Trade, I see this a lot with the crafting people that I interview, 
And this is an idea where you can justify making 17 diaper bags if you then sell them on Etsy. But it's unfortunate because a lot of times when we make something, we tend to value it higher than other people do. So we don't feel like we're getting out of it what we put into it. So it's often discouraging to making things. Gifting is a narrative that we often use. It's personal. I can justify making it even though it's probably going to be a little bit lower quality and it's going to cost me more. I can still justify it because I've made it for you and I'm going to give it to you. And then skill acquisition. And I see this um, with people who, like, people who are anticipating the zombie apocalypse. They, I, I, I'm going to learn how to make yeast out of potato skins because when the zombie apocalypse comes, I don't know how to make yeast and I'll be important to the tribe. Right? They're going to carry me and their, their group of people. So skill acquisition is, is another one. I think there's another narrative that we need to consider, and it's a well-being narrative. And I'm going to talk about that from two different lenses. One of them is the neurobiological lens, and the other one is positive psychology. And from the neurobiological perspective, there's a woman named Kelly Lambert who's doing amazing research called the Effort Driven Rewards Neural Circuit. This is the circuit that she's exploring. And she says that using our bodies and minds to produce meaningful goods is the neurological equivalent to our brains awash in natural antidepressants. She says that this is, it's a neural circuit that involves emotions and problem solving in your hands. So it's a whole body experience. It's not just in your mind. It's a mind-body neural circuit. And she says that the human brain evolved to reward making behaviors. And this makes sense because a group of people who produce more spheres are probably going to have more access to prey and edible protein than a group of people who don't. So there is some survival value there. People who make bowls are going to lose less of their food to the environment, to contamination, if they have a bowl to put it in. It makes sense that we would reward that, that that behavior would be rewarded over time. And this is the sensory homunculus, this little guy with the huge hands. And this is a brain real estate map. So a lot of our brain is, is dedicated to hand movement and to, to let's see his big lips. Um, so your hands are really involved in the way that the brain evolved over time. We often think of depression, stress, anxiety, of being in our head. And Kelly Lambert's work is beginning to suggest that maybe it's also in our hands, that some of those things are manifest through our hands. The positive psychology lens, I think, is the psychological manifestation of effort-driven rewards, the neurobiological effort-driven rewards. And positive psychology is a branch of psychology that was developed by Martin Seligman, and it looks at lives lived well. What makes for a happy, healthy, whole human being? Most of psychology in the past has focused on illness and disease. What causes schizophrenia? How do we prevent it? What causes happiness, and how do we increase it? How do we make that more accessible to people? And one of the things that contributes to happiness and well-being is psychological capital. And it's where you build this psychological resistance to things like stress and depression. And Martin Seligman suggests that psychological capital is built in, in many ways, one of which is through gratification. Gratification is when you invest your time and labor in something, and the labor is fruitful. You feel gratified. Now, we all know that sometimes the labor isn't fruitful, and that is the risk we have to take. Sometimes you make things and you think, ooh, <laughs> what happened there? And that's the risk we have to take for, for the things that do work that we get a reward for. Seligman suggests that there are shortcuts to happiness. That sometimes, and often in a knowledge economy, we experience pleasure without gratification. So the example here is a glass of orange juice. You're drinking a glass of orange juice and you experience pleasure from it. But you didn't plant the seed, you didn't grow the tree, you didn't pick the fruit, you didn't squeeze it. Sometimes you didn't even pour it in the glass. That's pleasure without gratification. You don't get any, you're missing out on all of the gratification you could have gotten that would have built you psychological capital. And instead, are just experiencing pleasure. And I think it's even, it's even more complex than that. This lamp is a lamp that I built. I was eight and a half months pregnant with my son. And it's, I went to woodworking with my 90-year-old grandmother and built this lamp. And it's walnut with a cherry inlay, and I turned the cherry base on the lathe, and it's a really cool lamp. I brought it home, and I showed it to everyone, and, you know, look at my gorgeous lamp. And everybody's patting me, oh, good lamp, Emily, that's really nice. And I'm building psychological capital, and I'm feeling great about myself, right? End of story. No, 
It's not the end of the story, because that lamp is in my living room, and I feel good every time I look at it. It has a compound interest. I am building psychological capital over time with this lamp, which is especially concerning when you think about the gifting narrative, where we give away all the fruits of our labor. <coughs> in a knowledge economy, we push around a lot of abstract thought, especially TED people, right? This is a group of people who are really working with abstract thought a lot. We're paper pushers and thought pushers and problem solvers of those complex thought ideas, right? And I think that we live in a gratification-impoverished culture, that we don't experience the gratifications that we used to, that used to be naturally built into our world. And I want to use, th these are the, the hockey stick problems, this is what I call these, and it's where at the end of the graph everything's going up. We feel chronically time deprived, we are heavily medicated, we're addicted, we're uh, stressed, we're less happy, we're in, incredibly in debt, we're overworked, we're hyper consumers, all that stuff goes up. And you can see how in this digital age that we live in, the stimuli that we experience in a day, how those things might increase. There's reason to believe that, that we might continue to experience a lot of stress and anxiety, and that we need to find ways to mediate those problems. I want to use the metaphor of physical health to talk about mental health. We used to live in a world where exercise was a natural byproduct of survival. You had to outrun the tiger in the jungle. You had to escape it. So you had to exercise in order to live. But that's not the world we live in now. The world we live in now doesn't require any exercise. And there's a ton of calorie-dense food at our ready, ready availability in the West. And we have had to have some behavioral interventions to prevent things like obesity and diabetes, which we know we don't do very well. And those interventions are eating, consuming less calories, and exercising. We even pay to exercise. We, we contribute our resources to gym memberships, which is something that would have been insane in the past. But we pay to exercise because we know it's important and we know that we need it to be healthy. I want to suggest that the same thing is true of gratification-inducing behaviors. That it's just as important to pay for your community college woodworking class on Tuesday and Thursday night as it is to pay for your gym membership. That it's important for your mental health to make things. That gratification is not a natural byproduct and that we have to consciously engage these behaviors in order to be mentally healthy. And that's how we begin to mitigate this increasing depression and anxiety that we see in our culture. That it's essential to our mental health that we become active producers of the goods in our lives. I want to tell you two more really good things about making stuff. This is the first one. This is a toilet seat, and it hangs on my living room wall, which my husband loves, right? No, he doesn't love like that. <laughs> It's, it was used for 40 or 50 years. It's one of those old, heavy toilet seats that's not plastic. And it hangs on our wall. And the wonderful thing about having a toilet seat on your wall is that it makes you less judgmental. <laughs> There's no room in the world for me to criticize anyone else's wall, right? It makes me a better person having a toilet seat on my wall. It also provides more freedom for other people. This is really good. It allows other people to create living rooms that don't come from Better Homes and Garden magazine. Because they can say, well, yeah, I'm putting this on the wall, but have you seen Emily's wall? It's a toilet seat. At least it's not that, right? It gives them freedom to do what they want in the house. So that's a really wonderful byproduct of having a toilet seat on your wall. This is another one. This was a tree that my grandfather cut down. And my husband and I were visiting, and I saw this huge stump. Oh, I'd really like to have that stump, you know. Well, sure, take it with you. So we load it into my husband's car, and we drive it down I-40, sparks flying everywhere, it weighs like 100 pounds, really heavy. We get it home, what are we going to do with this stump? I'd really like to try chainsaw art. You know, I've never tried that before. How hard can it be? So my husband, who's a good sport, we get out there with the chainsaw, start cutting into this thing. Turns out chainsaw art is really hard and complicated. And the most that we could manage was getting this X out of the bottom. And then I sanded it down, and I routed it, and fancied it up, you know, and, and we had this stool. And when we moved it from Arkansas to North Carolina, we packed the chainsaw on top of it, and the oil spilled down onto it, and made this really beautiful peace sign. And my daughter calls it the word stool. And it sits in our living room now. And people who come over to our house know something about us when they leave. They know 
that I'm married to a person who's willing to try chainsaw art, even though we don't know anything about it, and frankly, it's dangerous. <laughs> they know that I value the trees that grow on my grandparents' land. And that's something that you can't know from the Better Homes and Gardens chair. Right, this regular chair. This regular chair is a lot more comfortable to sit in. They're uncomfortable in our house <laughs> because they have to sit on this stool. But they're more socially connected to us when they leave. And that is it's such a wonderful relationship that we can develop with people through these items in our homes. Because people ask about that chair. And I believe that human making is an urge that we fulfill in a lot of ways. It's, it's not that we don't fulfill that urge now. We fulfill it through things like consumer rearranging. We move our living room around. We hang new curtains that we bought at Bed Bath & Beyond. We rearrange products that are produced for us by others. And while that's good, well, my mother has a beautiful living room that looks like a magazine living room. And it's a wonderful space, and she really enjoys being in it. But the authorship of the ideas is removed from her. So there's, she's living, it's a less authentic. It's, it's less her personality coming out. And the, the wonderful thing about making your own stuff is that you really become present in the space. You, and you get to live more wholly and more fully as yourself. And that's been a wonderful gift to me from my grandmother and hopefully a gift that I'll be able to pass on. And the take home of this talk is that as we begin to deal with a culture that creates a tremendous amount of stuff. We have to be mindful consumers. We know that, and there's a lot of talk about being a mindful consumer, but I think it's important also to be mindful producers. We pay people to do a lot of things that we can do ourselves. And as much as possible, the message here is to do it yourself if you can. Make it yourself. It's good for your mental health, it's good for our mental health, it's good for our community, and it's good for our environment. It makes sense, and I think that if we create our own worlds, if we become producers of the goods in our own lives and surround ourselves with the fruits of our labors, our quality of life goes up as we become more productive. Thank you.